take a pick, I, I'm, I'm leaning towards Michigan in that game. He's leaning towards Michigan. That's Joel Klatt from Fox Sports. He was on Breaking the Huddle, and he likes Michigan coming up in the game on Friday. Spoiler, I do too. Let's bring in uh, our, our first guest here on the Maze and Blue Review. Actually, our only guest uh, today, highlighted by former Michigan kicker Brandon Cornblue, who's here on TMBR. Brandon, how are you? Doing great. Great. How are you? I'm uh, great. Thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, I, I know you are from originally from South Florida, so you know the the Wolverines are all down there, concentrated. A lot of people headed down there, kind of your neck of the woods. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's I it was at the Ohio State game and then went to Indianapolis for the Big Ten championship. And so I was I was really hoping that we as we as we're winning that game that we weren't weren't headed to Dallas because I just another three straight travel games. I was I was hoping I could stay in my backyard. So hour and a half drive is much easier. Yeah, not too bad. Seems like the weather's been uh, as it usually is uh, pretty nice down there for Michigan and uh you know, you uh, we're, we're certainly going to talk about uh, uh, kicking and uh, corn blue kicking and, and everything. But, you know, just tell me that now that you've you've, you've watched Michigan uh, this year, uh, you heard what Joel Klatt had to say. I, I, you know, I'm picking Michigan in this game. You feel like they got a pretty good shot here against Georgia? No doubt. No doubt. You know, it's you know, as you watch as you watch the team and you read and hear about everything that's that's gone on from. You know, the springtime till till now, you just it's it's nothing but positive, you know, and the, the team, the chemistry, uh, you know, just everything that that is that is happening within the program is 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 positive, moving in a in a, in a positive direction. And, um, you know, I've always the last, you know, two, three years is, you know, we hear more criticism on Harbaugh. I have always been supportive. And my, my question is always, my response is always, well, who are you going to get that's better than Harbaugh? Like, what, what are you going to do? Who on earth are you going to put in that, that position that's going to do a better job and care more about the program than he does? And, you know, it, and it was just a matter of a couple plays here and there, a couple of games here and there that, that are the difference. I know here you're seeing it all time to come together. I remember, you know, with me as a player, you know, we were, we had, my freshman and sophomore years, we were four four lost seasons, and then my third year, we we go undefeated, win the national championship, and I always say that there was not much of a difference between those teams. It was just the, you know some of the chemistry, injuries, a couple of plays here and there, and and it just it's it's a whole different perception of what what is happening. And so you know, I know I know there's there's a difference with this team, and 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 there's there's some some great leadership and things happening there. But in terms of the the uh, the overall picture, I'm I'm more than happy with with the way things have, have been going, and obviously now now more people are happy with with how we're how we're doing. Uh, it's 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 really impossible to complain about about what's what's going on with the program today. Yeah, you got to be pretty happy, you know, running the kicking camps and and corn blow kicking everything that's going on. And you know, when you mention you know your playing career and your time in Ann Arbor, you know, '97, the, like you know. It, it's the gold standard and to think that, you know, if Michigan won two more games, just uh, where this season would rank and go down to uh, spoiler again, it would be right up there. People would be talking about this uh, forever. So uh, being on the brink of this with just a couple of days uh, to go, it's, you know, you can just imagine people are, are busting at the seams. You know, if I took you back to your playing days, uh, you know, I, I, you, you probably, you probably mentioned it over the years because Tom Brady is still playing, but, Tom Brady was, uh, if you go back to the to the late '90s, there at one point uh, he was your holder, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, we came That's in together. Story. You got You got to give me your best Tom Brady as your holder story. What do you say? So, um, I would say going into going into that that Orange Bowl, our last game. So we were we were 50 year seniors together, and and going into that that Christmas day, you know, the families weren't down yet. I'm from South Florida, about an hour, 50 minute hour drive away from where we were, you know, our hotel was in Boca Raton is where I'm from. And my family, uh, you know, we're still there. And so we had about 12, 13 guys from the team come down. We took buses and, 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 and came up to our, to our, my family's house and did Christmas dinner um, at our house. And 
we had, my dad had a, a 17 foot Boston whaler, just a small little boat uh, that he loved to take out. And so we, we had, but it was small enough to where we had to do it in, in shifts. Well, we did one shift and I went, I took some guys out, we come back and then we do, I think we did a second or third and, and, and it was the shift when Tom was on the boat um, and there was you know, four or five other guys on there. And, and I had, you know, driven out on this boat, you know, for at least half my life, you know, and, and never had any problems. Well, on that shift, we ran into a sandbar and had never, it had never happened before to me. So I'm like in, in an instant, I am, my mind is racing, going crazy. I've got the start, our starting quarterback here on this, on this boat. And I don't know how long it's going to take to get off the sandbar. And I know how coach Carr is with curfews. And this is, you know, probably five, six o'clock in the evening. You know, we've got 11 or 12 o'clock curfew. We're an hour away. And I'm just in my mind thinking everything I've ever dreamed and loved about Michigan. And I'm here in my last game and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be the reason our starting quarterback misses curfew and is benched for the game. And, you know, and all these things are racing. So I'm in, you know, not in, I'm just in, in like dress clothes and I jump out of the boat into the water and and push it off and, and kind of rock it a few times. And finally it, it, it came off the sandbar and we were, we were fine. But for, I don't know, probably a couple minutes there, my mind was in panic mode uh, for, for, for that, that uh, situation. So that was a, uh, that was a, a story that he probably wasn't as nervous as I was. Uh, but just for me had never gone, been through that experience before uh, and, and getting the boat stuck and uh, and so I was thinking that the tide was going to have to go in before we get it off there. And uh, fortunately, it ended up everything was good. We had a great dinner. Everybody got back on time, and he did his thing in the Orange Bowl. And we're we're here to talk about it today. Yeah, and you know he he went on to some great things, and he and he's still doing it, which is uh, amazing. So you 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 ran the greatest quarterback of all time up on a sandbar, and he almost missed the Orange Bowl. Well, you know it all comes full circle. You think about that Orange Bowl and. Michigan being down 14 points and, and coming back, but you guys win that game on, on a missed extra point. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where uh, when you're, you're, you're talking to any of your pupils there and talking about kicking, you know, you, even the extra point there, you don't want to be known for the, for the missed extra point in a, in a ball game, you know, right? Absolutely not. No, that's, that's why every, every kick matters. Every, every point matters, every play, you've got to be, mentally tough, mentally strong. And, and, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of coaching that goes into that. A lot of that is, is just how guys are wired, you know, and, and that's where the, the Tom Brady's of the world and, and certain guys that, that go to those highest levels, you know, they have, they have a certain, um, inner quality that they, they, you know, they're, they're built for those moments and, and they, they succeed in those moments. And even when they fail, they're willing to get back up and, and keep moving and keep moving forward. And, and, uh, you know, don't don't let those down moments, you know, define them. Yeah, well, let's talk uh, some kicking here. And uh, probably a good place to start is the current kicker, Jake Moody. He wins the Lou Groza Award for the for the best kicker, first Michigan kicker ever to uh, to win that award. What have you seen? You know, Jake Moody, he missed uh, two kicks, I think both from 47 yards, uh, two kicks from 47 yards. But. Other than that, didn't miss an extra point and uh, was pretty good, especially in the the middle of the season. Late in the season, Michigan really didn't need him except on those extra points. But what would you think of Moody's season? Oh, just, I mean, obviously an incredible uh, season full of just just almost near perfection, you know, in terms of his extra points. Um, you know, only a couple missed field goals and and, and really came through in, in critical times. If you look at that Michigan State game, even though uh, didn't didn't come out ahead, you know, there was it was probably his one of his defining moments or one of the, the for, for NFL scouts. What, what I think they're going to go and, and, and watch is on those. I think it was four three timeouts and four times he had to make the same kick in a row that uh, that they tried to ice him. And every kick was exactly it looked like a, a carbon copy of, of, of itself. And so that's the consistency that that Jake has and has has. You know, we saw that from him in high school. Uh, he, he started trying, training with me when he was in middle school. I've got a, a, a picture of him, you know, as a, as a little sixth, seventh grader and, uh, and starting with us. And, and he's just continued to, to work and improve. 
and you know to see it come come to where he is this season with a with winning the Lou Groves Award and All American honors and all that, those kind of things. Um, in addition to to all the team stuff uh, combined with all that, it's just it's just a a magical season for for the for the specialists. And you know Brad Robbins is is having you know has had an incredible year as well. You know he's going to be an NFL guy uh, at some point. And so you know there's there's a uh, you know a lot of a lot of talent that that we you know have tried to 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 groom and and point towards towards Ann Arbor. And so you know they they're uh, they're certainly seeing the fruits of their labor right now. Yeah, the the kicking game has uh, amazed me just where it's gone. You know, since even when you were kicking, I was just watching the the Monday night game last night, and right before the half, uh, the the kicker from the Saints, they're uh, actually it was the Dolphins. They're they're lining it up. It's fifty nine yarder, and you know they weren't even making a big deal about it. It's like, well, you know, they did take a sack, so this one was going to be a little bit further back, but. You know, they, they called the timeout right as he kicked it, you know, and looked like it would have been good from 65. He ended up missing it, but it, it's it's amazing just how far. I, I wanted to ask you because I see some high school videos. I see some of the ones that, that you uh, put out. Some of these guys, uh, these kids, I don't uh, uh, prospects, they're out there routinely, you know, 50-yarders, 60-yarders, uh, even in high school. That's not uh, during the games, but, uh, you know, can you talk about that evolution a little bit and just, uh, you know, the, the distance and what these guys uh, are doing and, and, and where do you think it's going? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, you look at 20, 30 years ago and the percentages of, of made kicks are, are just continuing to increase. Uh, and, and really what's what one of the main other things that's changing is just the strength of these guys. So you're not just getting a soccer guy who, you know, has has been pulled out to 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 play football. You're getting football players. Um, you know, you look at like Quinn Nordine. I mean, he was an athlete. You know, a true athlete. Uh, you know, a lacrosse, uh, a very highly recruited lacrosse player who you know who also kicked and and you know and so that's what coaches loved about him that he was more than just a, a stereotypical kicker. Uh, he was a football player. He was an athlete. He was a he was a leader. He was a a guy you know who didn't have any uh, issue with, with trying to, to, uh, you know, to be in the weight room, out compete other guys. And so you're seeing more and more of that. And so that's where you see the longer kicks and, and, you know, the, the the longer distances. And so that because of that, you know, all these leagues are having to change the rules to, to make things a little more challenging because kickers just keep getting better and better every year. And, and there's more and more guys that want to do it and see that it's, you know, a position that not only, uh, you can get earn scholarships and 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 make good money in the NFL, but it's just it's it's not it's not looked at as much of a um, you know kind of a a position that that only weak guys are a part of or, or or just you know just guys who aren't football players. So it's it's becoming a little bit more um, there's more more incentive for guys to do it, and and we're seeing more talented guys that are that are getting involved, and and there's increased coaching opportunities when i was in high school i would you, all that there, that existed was uh was a was a, a a camp or two in the summer and that was it and that and it was a few days and and then the rest of the year you're on your own now you have you know all around the country there's there's different coaches and camps and and opportunities for guys we, we offer training year round and and camps year round so so if guys want the help it's there uh let's hold you know break of you know christmas break and and you know through december january i've got guys from you know other parts of the country that are flying down here or, or other parts of florida that are that are trying to take advantage of, of private training because they they know that you know that little edge can can help them you know get get to another level and, and help them with their own game and and it's uh just getting more and more competitive yeah i mentioned corn blue kicking 90 percent of people that are watching or, or listening to the pod they're probably familiar uh, with your story of uh, of kicking at Michigan, going on and and having a kicking camp and and doing what you just said there and having guys uh, all year round and training and then and ranking them a, a, as well. But you know, as, when did you start that and and where's it at right now? When you talk about corn blue kicking, I mean, this is like this is something uh, every day, every week, every month. Of, yeah, how's yeah, it's, it going? it's it's year round and and because I'm in Naples, Florida, you know, it it, it allows me to be outside you know working with guys you know year round so that's where last year you know as quinn nordin you know finished his his his, his career at michigan came down to naples and, and it was in that first week of january that we started our process of trying to get get him ready for his pro day 
And uh, so it was, you know, three, three and a half, four months of, of work on a regular basis out in this, you know, 70 degree, 80 degree weather uh, to, to be able to do that. And, you know, other parts of the country, you just can't. So, you know, there's, we had a camp last week in Cowboy Stadium in Dallas. Uh, in February, we'll have a camp at, an, at the Colts indoor facility in Indianapolis. So there's, but that's harder to do, more expensive, obviously, to rent those kind of facilities. Uh, but we'll, we'll do that in the winter months a few times. But for the most part, it's, it's just really easy for me to, to, to be outside and, and working with guys any time of the year. Whereas up in, up in the North or, or most of the country, you know, it's, it's hit or miss whether you can get out there and, and really get, get good work in. So, yeah, we started doing rankings back in 2000 nine i believe i went full-time in 2007 with the camps 2009 and we started doing rankings uh 2008 2009 and uh yeah it's been it's been uh you know a lot of success a lot of great stories of guys over the years guys like eddie panero who never kicked a uh a field goal in high school and and went on we got him a full scholarship to to florida and went on to have a great career there and he's with the kicking for the New York Jets right now and and just guys like that where where it's it's helping them along the way helping them with the instruction and then also helping them find college programs to to get their scholarship or walk on opportunities and but but recruiting never stops it's a year round process and uh, as you know and so that's where I'm out there uh, looking for guys and trying to help develop guys you know, throughout, throughout the year. So it's, it's a, it, it never really stops. There's, a, there's a need for it. And um, so just trying to, trying to meet that need as best as we can. Yeah. Tell me about two guys uh, when it comes down to rankings. Uh, I saw you had them uh, ranked pretty high. Michigan has a, a freshman on the year, you know, I mentioned uh, uh, Robbins and, and Jake Moody already. They haven't needed uh, Tommy Duman, uh, but I, I noticed that you had him ranked number one as a punter, number two, as a place kicker and I know Jim Harbaugh talked about, well, maybe he'll do both. There's not many guys that, that do both. So there's a lot of different questions, but you know, earlier you talked about, uh, you know, stereotyping kickers and I, I was just looking at him uh, before I knew I, I had John and I noticed that he was six, five and, and I just don't remember many six foot five place kickers. So uh, I'm leaning towards without knowing anything or talking with anybody that, you know, he would probably be uh, a, a punter, but when it, when it comes down, when you have, uh, a guy that that might want to do both, or at, at one point he's got to pick one. Is it is a T need? Uh, and what about Doom in there? I know there's a lot of questions that I wrapped up in there, but yeah. uh, you're familiar with him. Sure, absolutely. No, he's he's a very talented kid. Uh, he is he is tall. You know, he's got great size, and so that lends a little more naturally to being a punter. And uh, it's it's just a more you know natural uh, swing that he has. I think that's if if you had to to pick one for his strength that would be punting, but he is a really good kicker too. So a lot of it has to do with need. You remember Kenny Allen did both, you know, and so it's possible Mike Gillette did both, you know, it, it can be done. Um, Hayden Epstein did, did both, but it's very difficult to, to, because they are a different motion, the, the, the field goal motion and the punting motion, they're, they're two different swings. So it's, it's, it's a lot of it is a matter of, managing your reps and making sure that you're not over overdoing it during the week and practice so you have to have coaches that understand it and and are our understanding of the workload that you're trying to avoid like a pitcher in baseball would uh trying to trying to make sure that you're still fresh by the middle or end of the season so so it's it's there's a lot that goes into that and in, in terms of the you know the 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 managing it and making sure they're not over kicking and over punting you know throughout the week and so uh, it's, it can be done, but it's, it's not ideal. So, you know, over the last, since Harbaugh has been there, they've always tried to, to share duties. And, and even though there were some guys that could do both, they, they tried to, to, to have a, a kickoff guy, a field goal guy and a punter. And, um, you know, so it's just really a matter of just finding that whoever, whoever's performing the best at that time, that's, that's who they're going to, going to put in there. Tell me Michigan, uh, recruited, this is, uh, for next year, the 2023 class, um, a kid here locally out of Huron, Ann Arbor Huron, uh, Huron Adam Samaha, I believe is how you say his name. Right. Uh, and and you ranked him. Is, is it hard? Is that the hardest part of your job ranking the uh, the kickers? It would seem like it, that could be the most difficult part. But is is that the most difficult part? Well, I put a lot of time into that. It, it's difficult, and only in the sense that I I want to make sure that I don't I I don't 
evaluate a guy, you know, uh, in a, in a, uh, in a way that's not accurate. So, you know, we don't, if I see a guy, um, you know, or we have a camp, like it, it, it's not a quick process to, to, to update our ranking. So we only do that probably three or four times a year uh, because I, I really spend a lot of time looking at the numbers, looking at the film on, on how they did, um, looking at their big pictures, you know, for, like for Jake Moody, when he was in high school, we, uh, we increased his ranking uh, based on how he did after we had you know known him so well, but he had such a good senior season that we were able to look at, and we don't usually do that, but we looked at the game film and saw, I mean, he's making these 55, 57 yard field goals uh, consistently in games. And so it's pressure situations, which is ultimately the, the, the best test of, of what these guys can do. And, and, and he was doing it, you know, he had the, the situations and games to, to opportunities to show what he could do. And he was doing it and capitalizing uh, pretty much every time. So that, that increased his, his, his uh, evaluation for us because we don't see him every week or every month being, you know, being down here in Florida and, and him being in Michigan and other guys in different States. So, you know, he, he earned our number one ranking and, but that a lot of that came, you know, towards the end with his, with his senior season. So um, every guy's different, you know, every situation is different, but we, you know, we try to get as much information as we can, just like any scout or college coach would, or NFL coach would, and, you know, and, and do the best evaluation you can, but, but it's, it's a need because in terms of the specialist kickers, punters, long snappers, most coaches don't don't really understand how to how to evaluate them and they, they're looking for help. And when you look at uh, the, the, the you know, the, the, the recruiting services that are out there, the, the two, two, four, seven and, and rivals and all these different you know, publications, they don't typically they always say we're, we're going to leave the, the kicking rankings to you. You know, we're not going to even touch that because you guys know that field. We don't. And so. It's it's uh it's it's where we we try to try to help as much as we can with the specialists who are often overlooked. Back in the seventies, Michigan had a, a kicker named Super Toe. He was left foot dominant. They had Mike Lantry, and I notice uh, Samaha. He is left uh, dominant, left footed kicker. I don't know how whatever however you say that. Yeah. Uh, what's Michigan getting in this in this prospect? Uh, he's a he's a really smooth. Um, you know, get great tempo, you know, really smooth field goal kicker. So uh, he's not, he's not as much a punter. Uh, so he's not, a, you're not going to, I don't think have a combo um, issue with him, but, but he's just, he's a really talented guy that when we, the first time we saw him just was just really impressed with how he was doing. Now rewind a little bit. And he was, I think four years old and his dad uh, brought him out to one of our camps that was in, in Glick Fieldhouse, and um, and so he he had kind of a, a, a um, be, he was around the kicking world at a very young age, and so you know he's he's I've known of him a long time, but I hadn't hadn't seen him uh, until until uh, I guess it was about a year year and a half ago, and uh, and so he's 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 a good one. So right now he's at the top of his class, but it's a it's a really competitive class. So um, but but Michigan. He's got him committed right now, and and so we'll we'll see what happens there. I got a quick hitter for you. What if it comes down? Uh, Michigan's down one, and it's the last second. It's a forty-five yarder uh, for Jake Moody. Well, do you, do you think like you know you're, you're talking pressure and you talk about Mel Tucker before the half calling all those timeouts? Uh, it, it, is it routine? But so would you think Jake Moody? You know, when it comes down for a, a pressure kick. How much is he feeling? How much uh, is the special teams coach, the head coach? And then for you from afar, is it all like you guys stay consistent? Like, hey, you know, you know, it's snap, hold, kick. It's all that. That's what the coaches are thinking. That's what the players are thinking. Everything else is blocked out. Or because you'd be far away or maybe in the stands, would you, would you be a little bit nervous then? Um, I certainly would be nervous. I, I'd probably be more nervous than, than Jake and some of those guys out there, the snapper, the holder. You know, they have to do their job. Uh, it's, it's a different being a specialist. It's a different mindset than the other positions, you know, a linebacker, or a lineman, you know, they're out there and they're using, you know, much more aggression and force. And it's as a specialist, you're more of like a golfer where you just have to stay composed and, and do your job, you know, without being too high, too low. And, and you have to, to keep that, 
that even, and that's where Jake is so good because that's his personality. He is just so level and just, there's, just, there's not much up and down with him uh, as opposed to somebody like a Quinn Nordine who's, who's a lot more up and down and emotional, uh, more like a Justin Tucker or somebody like that would be, which is not, it's not good or bad. It's just, it's just different personalities. So, uh, you know, if, if it comes down to a, a kick for the win the game, I'll take that situation and and uh, and I and I like Michigan's chances in that in that situation for sure. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll take a, a 23-22 Georgia lead with one second, but Michigan kicking a forty-five yarder with Jake Moody. I feel pretty good about him potting that. Michigan going to the championship game against Bama or Cincy. Brandon Corbello, certainly appreciate your time. I, I have it on the screen here, but those that may just be listening to the the podcast at Corn Blue Kicking, people that are interested. In, uh, in in your camps or anything that you do, would you direct them there? I know the the website is uh, is there on Twitter. Anything else that people should know? Yeah, uh, Twitter corn blue, at Corn Blue Kicking, uh, Instagram as well, and then and then our website just cornbluekicking.com. dot com. But uh, but yeah, we're we're out there and 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 doing doing camps and training throughout the throughout the year throughout the country, and so uh, trying to trying to help as many guys as we can, and just just excited you know, right now with, with, with a lot of guys, in different parts of the country, different, different levels, NFL, college, high school, but, but, uh, but certainly our, our Wolverine specialists are, are getting it done at a very high level and, and, uh, and making it, making it easy and fun for me to watch. Hey, great job. Thanks uh, for staying so long with me. Enjoy the game coming up on, on Friday and all the best to you. Thanks. Same to you. Go blue. All right. See you, Brandon. All right. There he is. Brandon corn blue, former Michigan kicker, Corn blue kicking. How about that? These kickers, you know, you 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 hear about the athletes that uh you know end up making a big time program like Michigan, end up going pro, whatever. Say, oh yeah, you know, this guy by the you know, he was he was five years old. You knew it when he was six years old. He just mentioned the two of the kicker, four years old. You know, these guys out there kicking when they're when they're four years old. A job. Brandon corn blue. All right, uh, we've got a few more things to cover here. I've got some audio for you uh, from a college football analyst who likes Michigan coming up on Friday. Uh, We have uh, a number of people lining up here with some feedback. I always like to read the feedback, and we'll go right to it here. CS, is Dax Hill out with COVID? Uh, I will say maybe to that. I know that there's a lot – I don't not reports, rumors, but – him not being in Miami, I, I have seen that out there. I, I know that uh, George Pickens, the wide receiver from Georgia, and JT Daniels, the quarterback from Georgia, they just went down there yesterday, and you know that they had some positive tests. So uh, however this is going to work out, I mean, we we knew that there's a possibility of, uh, of positive tests and, and people missing the game. It's not a sure thing. It hadn't been ruled out yet. Uh, you know, who knows? Maybe – you could have a a situation wherever that 10 day is. Maybe they change the protocol like the NFL and NBA are doing on the fly. It's five. Maybe you have a a false positive. Maybe you can get, you know, two tests before that where he can be out there and play. I mean, all those, uh, all those things are possibilities and probably three or four more things that I'm not even thinking of, but uh, yeah, I mean that that's out there. It's being talked about complete confirmation maybe it's happened over the last couple minutes here but i haven't seen that but there is a possibility there um as an alabama fan go blue yeah well or i I don't know if i've ever roll tide you know we'll see in the championship game that would be pretty sweet no boy uh he has more to say here michigan's offensive line has to dominate the line of scrimmage against georgia to open up the running game that will include double teaming Jordan Davis to make him work. Michigan has a good player in Will Johnson. Uh, yeah, talking about the corner that came in this year. Yeah, you know what? Michigan's offensive line, they uh, and, and Georgia's defensive line, one of the one of the uh, the great matchups of this game. I know the dogs fantastic, a, a brick wall all season long against uh, the run. We know that's been Michigan's identity, so. You know, it's not like Michigan's. I, I don't think that they're going to come right out and say, "No, we're not going to try to, to, to run the ball." And they're going to see what they can do there, and you know, sometimes you just have to keep doing it, doing it, doing it till you break one, or just keep doing it, doing it, do it till it pays off. Maybe you can get some uh, uh, benefits even in the second half. But yeah, I don't think Michigan's going to go completely away from the run. Do I think that they could still use their backs and 
throw screens to him and, and get Godzilla, Jordan Davis, running a little bit, 6'6", six, six, you know, 360, get him, you know, hot, steaming a little bit where, you know, you can, you know, get him running rather than just stay right there in the tackle box. You know, I, I think that's uh, something that will definitely be considered. Uh, CS here. Um, a Georgia podcaster said Jordan Davis can run 20 miles an hour. Yeah. Well, you know what? Michigan podcaster, I go 25 miles an hour. How about that one? I don't, I don't know. Maybe he can, you know, Jordan Davis. I, I had him on my, I had him at number one on my Heisman list heading into championship Saturday. Now Georgia lost the game and, you know, Bryce young, who I had three, on that list heading into the championship game, vaulted up to number one and obviously uh, won the Heisman, but that's how I would have voted it. But I would have had Davis as uh, one of my top three there. So it's not like, uh, you know, I'm, I think he's overrated or uh, he sounds like he's a great player off the field as he is on and big 99. Get the nickname Godzilla. You better be pretty good. Um, let's see more here coming through. Kate McNamara. And those wide receivers have to make big plays against the Georgia secondary. But you know what? You listen to enough people talk about uh, Georgia's defense. They all say really nice things about the defensive line and the front seven, talking about the speed, sideline to sideline. But at some point, when you're listening to people that have watched Georgia, they say, hey, they're susceptible uh, to the pass, that you can get their corners, that you can throw the ball over their head. And you know what? I, I feel pretty good. You know, Michigan's wide receivers and, and what they – have been able to do this year. And it's not just one in Cornelius Johnson. It's not just two in, uh, in Roman Wilson. They have had uh, a number of guys. Andrew Anthony came on big playability. You know, there's three and you know, the way that the tight ends, I think it was yesterday. Was it Jim Harbaugh? Josh, I think it was Josh Gaddis saying they're underrated or the unsung heroes. I think the, the way that he put it and, you know, the, the way Schoonmaker came on and the hands that he displayed, that guy, you know, is a monster. And then Eric All, of course, had the 47-yard touchdown against Penn State. You know, Michigan's passing game, Kate McNamara, give the guy a little bit of time and, you know, and let him deal, especially between the hashes. His ability to throw that ball, he can do it. And, you know, McCarthy, maybe, you know, moving around, moving the pocket a little bit you know, airing it out, seeing if he can uh, find Roman Wilson, a little X factor there uh, for Michigan. But yeah, I think that they're definitely going to have to throw the ball a little bit. JJ gets 20 plays against the dogs. I don't know. That'd be a lot. 20 plays would be a lot, but you know, he's going to be in there. You know, that when you start thinking about a lot of what we do is we start talking about different things that teams will do instead of, you know, Hey, run the ball, get first downs, you know, just do the normal. People start talking about um, Donovan Edwards throwing a 75-yard pass, or uh, I was talking to myself, you know, A.J. Henning, lining him up in the backfield like the the 49ers do with, with Debo Samuel or we saw with Cordell Patterson what the Falcons were doing against the Lions, and, you know, they've been doing that with Patterson, uh, different teams uh, in different years. Use Henning like that, but it, it, it's fun to talk about like that. I, you know, maybe they will. That's a lot of reps, more reps uh, for McCarthy than than I would guess. So if I had to put it over and under uh, reps on McCarthy, I'd put him at, uh, you know, 10. So you would go way over on that. You know, I've gone this far. How long have I gone here? 34 minutes. And I haven't talked about the biggest news. Now, you may say, hey, that's Dax Hill. And, you know, you're not going to be wrong about that. But Michigan yesterday picks up an All-American center in the transfer portal. He was one of three that was named as a uh, Remington Trophy finalist for the best center in in all of college football. Aluskun Olawatimi. Aluskun Olawatimi is a stud All-American, and he's going to take over snapping the ball through from Andrew Fastardis. I mean, this is a fantastic news. It's like, you just love, I tell you, most people that are watching this, I know somebody watching it said they were an Alabama fan, but most people watching this, watching this right now, 
you know, they're Michigan fans. And it is a great time to be a Michigan football fan. It's just like great news after, you know, good news after great news after surprising news. But, you know, this is great news. Michigan getting a loose gun, Olawatimi, Olawatimi, and yeah, it, it takes a little bit, but you know, after a while, it starts rolling off your tongue. Olawatimi, uh, some of the uh, uh, metric numbers on it. First of all, he started 32 straight games, so he's durable. How about the size on this center? 6'3", 310, and he is a mauler in the run game. Pro Football Focus, second highest run blocking grade for any center in college football. Not too shabby. Uh, allowed three sacks and five quarterback hits in 21 and all of last year. That's right up there on the top. Uh, and you look at the other two centers that were the Remington Trophy finalists, um, uh, Alec Lindstrom. Yeah, it sounds like a hockey player. Uh, Boston College. So does Linderbaum, who Michigan saw in the Big Ten Championship game at Iowa. We knew he was a good one. Uh, he's a great one. But uh, Aluska and Oluwatimi, right in with those three, and Michigan gets him snapping the ball next year. They think about the run game and just what the doc, you know, the, the transfer portal, and Michigan's going to have guys hitting the transfer portal, there's no doubt. But bringing in an All-American, I know. Everybody likes recruiting, and you know you look at you know the prospects and everything else. And yeah, I'm focused on the Orange Bowl too. Why wouldn't you be? You know, <laughs> first time ever college football playoff Friday. Let's go! But man, Aluska and Olawatimi, let's have a party. It, it feels like you know it's it's just time to party with that news right there. Great news for 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 Jim Harbaugh. You know, great news all the way around here. Sharon Moore's got to be, you know, giddy about Michigan's offensive line coach. Uh, if you're if you're Mike Hart and you're talking to those backs, you're talking to Blake Corum saying, hey, Oluwatimi, whoever the quarterback's going to be next year, you know, um, all good stuff there for uh, for Michigan when you, you think about next year and their offensive line and, you knew that they were going to lose for Stardust, and they're going to lose uh, Stuber as well. But already, they've got an offensive line that's coming back that is stout. And you, know, you talk to enough people that know football, they'll say, yeah, you know, you win the games uh, up front. Not going to get much of an argument uh, from uh, from people that know football on that. And the center is the key to it all. And they got an All-American. <laughs> they got one of the best two years in a row. You know, he's been on that uh, uh, Remington list, and this year, one of the three finalists. I mean, this is just straight up uh, great news for Jim Harbaugh and and company there. So, uh, for, so fantastic. You know, the recruiting spotlight, every day I do two things. Uh, one is the memorabilia minute, and the other one is the Michigan recruiting spotlight. The Michigan recruiting spotlight – was uh, Brandon Cornblue talking about one of Michigan's four commits for next year, Adam Samaha, who he knew kicking down at Glick Fieldhouse from nearby Ann Arbor Huron when he was four years old. Pretty good. We'll play that sound in the future on the Michigan recruiting spotlight. When I go to the memorabilia minute, before I do that, I've got, I've got a place kicking picture of memorabilia. So, Bring it on Brandon Cornblue. I thought it was very appropriate. Of course it is. But let's go back and hit a couple more here on the feedback. It's Doughboy. Michigan needs to change that old school offense to a spread offense with the quarterback that they just got. Uh, I think you're talking about Orgy, Alex Orgy. I, I, I don't I don't think they need to change what they're doing here. Remember, you know, Michigan's got Kate McNamara and they've got J.J. McCarthy and they recruited, uh, they got Jaden Denegal, and they got Alex Orgy, and, uh, oh, yeah, they got Dan Valari on here. I mean, it's, uh, who knows how many of these guys they're going to be able to keep, but uh, Michigan's not changing anything to any kind of spread offense. Now, could they do something, you know, uh, Valari was going to be used in some short yardage situations. Uh, Harbaugh had mentioned this, that, you know, he could be, you know, that guy in the, in the short yardage uh, situations that 
and it, that never did materialize, but, you know, could it materialize with um, uh, next year with Valari in short yardage situations? Maybe. And uh, uh, Orgy, if he stays that quarterback, you know, could he be that guy in there? But, you know, the that's the only spot if, you know, if things are going to stay the same right now that you can see guys even getting in would be in some, some uh, unique situations just to try to change things up. But uh, yeah, I don't think that kind of stuff is uh, happening. Let's uh, go here. More feedback. Antoine getting in today. I used to think Ohio fans were some of the worst. I don't think that anymore. In fact, some Ohio fans have been pretty nice, but them damn Georgia fans are straight delusional. You know, I, I think it always depends, like, where you're getting your, you know, your opposing fan base from. Like, if you're hanging out on Twitter or you're, you're hanging out online or, or posting boards or something like that, you know, you're going to get, I mean, what you're asking for are straight up barbs and trash talk. And, you know, that's what you're asking for that if you show up. You get somebody person to person and talk with them, you know, they can say, oh, yeah, it's, sure. You know, we get a little trash talking, but what about this? What about that? Yeah. Uh, and you can find some of that online, but when you get online or you get on talk radio, uh, it, it, it mostly plays to the lowest common denominator. That's just uh, what happens. And you know what? There's a part about this. This is what I always said. Uh, I've got a friend who's, uh, you know, he's a big time hockey fan. And I mean, you ask him his four favorite sports, you know, it's hockey, 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 you know, then football down here. But, you know, his uh, his family's from Canada and I stayed at his cottage one time and, you know, it's all they want to do is talk about hockey, you know, so, but I appreciate it. You know, they, and I like hockey, but at the end when they're coming over, they're like, you know, that guy's not, he, he was talking, they were talking about me and he's like, he's not really into hockey. I'm like, well, not like you guys. I say all that, you know, SEC fans, that's what they're into. Like I love football, college football. Michigan is uh, is everything. You know what? I really like Michigan basketball, Michigan hockey, and I like baseball too. Michigan baseball. I like uh, I like all four of those sports. Everybody's got the other sport. SEC fans, you know, Alabama fans like Alabama football, Alabama football, Alabama spring football. Here's Alabama's top four sports: Alabama football, Alabama recruiting. Alabama spring game, Alabama transfer portal, Nick Saban commercials. Those are their top five, you know, favorite things. And it's not too far away from the dogs. And you know what? If Michigan had number one recruiting classes coming out of their ears the last five years, like uh, Kirby Smart does, there would be a lot more Michigan recruiting fans. There's a lot of big, there's a lot right now. Is that off on a tangent? Uh, D Brown, did you talk about Dax yet? Did I talk about getting vaxxed yet? Oh, no, Dax. Yeah, we did. We talked about Dax. Yeah. It would be a big loss, you know, especially considering yesterday, you know, that was going to be the uh, the tight end eliminator, you know, Dax Hill. So nothing, at least that I've seen here, maybe I should look, maybe it's coming out as official or something, but, but there's still a chance, but, you know, yeah, a chance that he could be out, still a chance that he could play. I mean, I'll have to see on that. That's what. We talked about craziness with uh, fan bases, Alabama, Doughboy, Michigan has closed the recruiting gap between themselves and Ohio State. You know what? Nothing helps you more than winning on the field. But, you know, recruits are looking for playing time for sure. They're looking to get to the NFL. A lot of them are looking for education. and. Uh, a lot of them want to play for a championship, you know, so if you can offer all of those things and, you know, Michigan has long been able to uh, offer a lot of different things, but offering playing in the big 10 championship game or offering playing in the college football playoff, uh, other teams are like, why are you going to go to Michigan there? They got everything else, but not if you want to play in the college football playoff. And now they have that. So plus with the uh, name, image and likeness that even some things up transfer portal, even though Michigan hit it, and I talked about um, Aluska and Ola Latimi being able to get, but um, that Michigan, that that they, uh, because of the transfer credits, seems like they are playing a little bit shorthanded when it comes to the transfer portal. But everything else now, NLI, winning on the field, like 
helmets, uniform, academics, like, all right, you know, Michigan's uh, back. That's how you even things up with Ohio State. Beat them on the field and then, uh, you know, be able to, you know, offer things like that you can with name, image, and likeness now, too. That is big. One more here. Raymond says, this has been a great season so far, especially after last year. Well, you know what, Raymond? I'm going to tell you, you know, we had Brandon Cornblue on, if you're just joining us earlier, and he said, you know, he'd never wavered at all about Jim Harbaugh, and and, and he stayed with him through the thick and thin. I, I think that's a real um, minority opinion when it came down to, uh, to Michigan fans after last year. I could tell you, that through the fourth season, the fifth season after that 62 nothing game, I still said when when I had people that I worked with, Michigan fans saying, you're crazy, you know, it was the Harbaugh, they need to move on. I said, look, I, I always put myself in the position of Ward Manuel and said, hey, what would I do if I was Ward Manuel? And every year I said, I, I still think Jim Harbaugh is the best guy for the job. No, he's not beating Ohio State, but does he know what it takes to beat Ohio State? I mean, who knew more than Jim Harbaugh what it was going to take to beat Ohio State? No, he hadn't had any success. 2016, they were that close, however you want to say it. And some people say, uh, you know, and they could have won that one. But you know what? Last year, I watched how the team played. I watched the, you know, the team – get smacked upside the head by Michigan state. I saw him not get prepared at the beginning of the game against Indiana. I saw Wisconsin came in and played a physical game. And it looked like the Michigan players quit out there. And I saw a Penn state team, toothless Penn state team come in and, uh, and out will Michigan. I, you know, I, I had, I thought after that, that, uh, you know, I broke and said, I thought it was time. I, I don't think that, of course, I'm, I'm saying, like, I don't think you're a, a bad person. or reason. I thought it was very reasonable after last year to say, hey, you know what? Maybe Michigan should move on. I thought it was very reasonable. But, you know, and I do think the majority of people agreed with me on that. But, yeah, to, I look at it now as, you know, the, one of the great stories uh, in all of sports. What if I told you? A former player came back, and and almost everybody uh, had abandoned him and thought it was time to move on. And the coach was out there and uh, had success in the NFL, but nobody was giving him the time of day. And he had to come back almost on his crawling on his hands and knees at a reduced salary for the Wolverines, but then led him to the Big Ten Championship and the college football playoff. Now, the story only gets better from here. A win on Friday, a, a, a win, a, a championship. It, it's it, having it in grasp and all that. It, it's it's close, but man, it still feels a long ways away. But getting a win on Friday, man, it, it it's going to feel a little bit like if Michigan is able to get this win on Friday, like this, uh, you know, sports euphoria. Like I I don't know how people are going to like. It's already like that. The Ohio State game, the, the almost the entire game was like that. The Big Ten championship game was like that. I just don't know how much more euphoria Michigan fans, they're, they're here for it. Everybody's here for it. But, you know, to uh, it, it's been a long time. So, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. But just having this, uh, uh, the winning, and, you know, you saw what happened in, in recruiting because – of how Michigan's performing on the field. And now you see uh, Ola Timi coming aboard, an All-American center for next year. I mean, it's just over and over. It, it, it reminds me of last year for the Michigan basketball team heading into the, the season. I remember we had COVID and everything else. They're just happy to get out there and have a season and having the guys compete. But really, you know, Michigan was picked to – you know, finish a, a little bit, pretty much in the middle of the pack of the Big Ten. And I thought, heck, if they could finish in the top four or five, you know, that'll be a good season. Well, you know what? They they started out 11-0. and And, you know, they, they got to a point near that at the end where they're playing for the Big Ten championship. It's like every single thing that you looked at, it was like, this thing's going so great, like everything. You, you just couldn't talk about Juwan Howard enough. Each one of the assistants, all of the players, how everything was going. And you know how difficult 
it is to get all of those levers and everybody rowing and all of it. And Michigan basketball had it last year. And it was, uh, it, you know, I know they didn't go to the final four. They were that close and they didn't win the championship, but man, that was one of the, the considering what was going on in the world and, and how it was a surprise. It was just, um, it was just pure joy, you know, being able to enjoy athletics and, and, and Michigan hoops. I'm not going over that. That was it, man. It was, it was awesome. That team will be, uh, will go down in, I'll mention it always as a, a surprise, as a, as an entertaining of a season that no, didn't end up ultimately with a championship. I get that part, but it was, uh, it was special. And then this year's football team, also a surprise. Like, I know a lot of people that cover Michigan, and I know some are, you know, you'd say, man, that person, that guy's an uber homer. You know, that person would never say anything. You know, uh, you, you kid me, they'd never say anything bad about Harbaugh. I, I didn't see anybody picking Michigan to win more than eight, nine games. Nobody. Nobody. And then, you know, so this was uh, as or more surprising than last year. And here's Michigan with two um, – of the reigning coaches of America, Jim Harbaugh, coach of the year, Juwan Howard, coach of the year. I mean, how about that? Fantastic times, at least uh, in the sports realm, which we are talking about here. And yeah, we're, we're still in all of this and just hoping that we can get both teams out there with all of their players to be able to compete in that game. I mean, that's the thing. Like, your guess, as we sit here, we don't know. Who knows what's going to happen with the testing and how things are going to go and who's going to be available or not. So just sit back and uh, and hope for the best. That's where I'm at uh, right now with it. What else are you going to do? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't have that answer. What else you're going to do? All right, so thanks to Brandon Cornblue who came on. Oh, I had two pieces of audio that I wanted to play for you that reminded me here so let's get to that and this audio is from a espn analyst roddy jones he played football at georgia tech and i heard roddy reminds me of roddy white who played for the atlanta falcons or roddy roddy piper but roddy jones played football at georgia tech he's a college football analyst now i was listening to him on Sirius XM, and he was talking about uh, the Orange Bowl, and he was asked if um, in the Orange Bowl, does he think Georgia, does he like Georgia, or does he think that the Wolverines just keep it rolling? I think I've convinced myself that the Michigan train keeps rolling and it really comes down to their front in Hutchinson, David Ajabo um, and the rest of that front being able to get pressure on Stetson Bennett with, with four, like, I don't think they're going to have to send any more bodies and then they're going to play cover two, cover two man behind it. And so I, my question then is you have guys that can, that can make plays on, on let's say jump balls, contested catches, and I think George Pickens is that guy. Brock Bowers, good player, really good player. So maybe he's that guy. Um, but to be able to do it consistently, you're going to have to protect Stetson Bennett. And I'm not convinced that they're going to be able to do that consistently. I'm not convinced that they're going to be able to do that consistently either. And I think that's the path for a Michigan victory. Stetson Bennett, stop the run, make Bennett, and I know he likes to run too, Put some hats on him, force some turnovers, get some extra possessions. Roddy Jones, the college football analyst from ESPN. So, one more piece of audio from Jones. He was asked who he likes in the Orange Bowl. Uh, and then on the other side, I, I you know, I'm not, I'm not 100 sure that Michigan's going to be able to, to move the ball all that often, but you only got to be good on two or three drives. And I think the way Michigan's operated this year, they are comfortable in that kind of game where, hey, look, we're going to get stopped some. It's going to be, you know, it, it's going to be a slog for most of it. We're going to rely on our defense. But we can be good enough on two or three drives to be able to go and win this game. Because I think, you know, I, I think 21, 24 points is probably going to win it for either team. 
So, so I like, uh, I like Michigan in this one because of their ability to run the football and to create pressure. And, and Georgia um, has not been able to, to create a, as good as the defense has been. Getting pressure with just the defensive line has not been a strength of theirs. They don't have the bona fide pass rusher off the edge. They do a lot of twists and stunts and blitzes uh, with Nicobe Dean, with Channing Tindall to be able to create that pressure. So I think, uh, I think uh, I've convinced myself that Michigan wins the game. Um, maybe some of that's my Georgia Tech bias, um, but I've been <laughs> high on Georgia all year. I just think they were exposed a little bit against Alabama. I don't know. I don't know if they were exposed a little bit. They lost the game. They were exposed a little bit in terms of the points they were getting up, giving up. Exposed a little bit in terms of uh, people talking about it being a generational defense. And they exposed a little bit of a team that's relying too much on their defense to get them to a championship. No, Kirby Smart, he can't beat Alabama, and he can't beat the championship teams either. They lost to LSU, uh, what, two years ago, Joe Burrow and company in that SEC championship game. They always lose to Alabama in the SEC championship game. Uh, you know, I know if you're a college football fan, you know Georgia. Besides Georgia, it's like, you know what, let's see, uh, let's see somebody else give it a shot against Alabama because Georgia can't do it. I want to see that uh, rematch. So we had Brandon Cornblue on earlier. And along with the Michigan's uh, recruiting spotlight that we do every day, we also do have a memorabilia minute. And for the memorabilia minute here, we don't need Mr. Jones anymore up there. There it is. So this was my uh, grandfather-in-law passed away a few years ago. He had this picture up in his uh, on his wall on his steps and if you look this goes back to 94 i mean it looks like it could be back from the 50s but this is remy hamilton and it, there's old remy right there and he's kicking the ball against notre dame september 10th 1994 and they put the kick out there as they made this but that's the memorabilia minute from today we wouldn't sell this for a million now well, maybe we would for a million but it it sits up here in the studio. It's I get the glare and everything on it, but I, I was looking for the ball. I just can't find it on there when you look. But there's the memorabilia minute. The kick, 94, 26, 24. It ended up going down. Remy Hamilton, Michigan kicker, always known for that particular kick. I remember years after, was it years after or right after? It was bartending at, uh, I guess, scorekeepers or whatever it was. I was ready to come in and say, and probably a lot of people brought that particular picture up and say, hey, Remy, let me have a signature. All right, there it is. Coming up tomorrow, I've got an offer or two out there. I'm hoping for a commitment. I would say I have a soft commitment right now because I did get a response, but I'm not ready to reveal who the guest is. We'll have to see what happens uh, tomorrow at one o'clock, we're here every day at one o'clock talking about uh, Michigan weekdays and then on after Michigan football, basketball and uh, Michigan football and basketball games. And so what you got Thursday, Michigan basketball down at Central Florida I'll be on after that game. And then Friday. After the Orange Bowl, Woo! I don't know, man, like. uh we could be ringing in the new year right here on the Mason Blue Review. Could happen. That happens. I'll have to get the party favors out. And depending on how that game goes, it could be a celebration into 2022. Who needs uh, – who's uh, who's bringing it in that I saw this year? Miley Cyrus and uh, of the, the comedian. Davidson? Pete Davidson? That's it? Who needs Dick Clark or Pete Davidson or Miley Cyrus or Post Malone? We'll have the uh, Michigan championship, uh, Michigan semifinal postgame show, championship preview, ringing in the new year, hopefully, coming up this uh, Friday. I'll be back uh, tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Everybody have themselves uh, a great afternoon. Oh.